as well. So welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's that time. It's uh, four minutes past 12 now on, on Wednesday. So it's our it's our coffee breaks. Um, we've been doing this for over a year now, um, and it's certainly been one of the highlights of my week. And this week is going to be exactly that a highlight of the week because we have a really special guest joining us today um recommended to us by Mahela who has just joined the call hi Mahela um welcome um Kim give us a wave as well again I know you just waved it but Kim um Kim's going to be talking to us today about positive mindsets and before you all joined we were having a conversation about this and I gave her the example um, of um, a couple of cafe owners um, in a high street nearby myself, nearby where I live. Um, coffee shops, 25 metres from each other. Um, and a few weeks into lockdown um, last year, one of them closed um, and the other stayed open. Um, the one that's closed is um, just reopening now. Um, the one that stayed open, stayed open as much as they could, rules and regulations permitting, all the way through lockdown. Um, and I, I wrongly assumed that the one that stayed open had must have had a positive mindset, um, and the one that closed down must have had a negative mindset. But Kim very quickly put me right and raised some questions in my mind um, about that scenario. Um, and... Um, Kim, you're going to explain why um, to us in a minute. Um, but before we do that, um, Kim has asked lots of questions today, lots of interaction. Um, come off mute whenever you want. Uh, let's get involved. Let's make this uh, let's make this an exciting interactive session for for everybody. So, um, Kim, over to you. Cafe owners, who was positive and who was negative? Thanks so much, Mark. And what I said to Mark was, it almost didn't really matter whether you closed or whether you stayed open, but the mindset you were in when you did either of those things would have made the difference. So if you decided to close down and then you were right, this is going to be the opportunity for me to completely rethink my business. I'm going to retrain. I'm going to think about studying the market, looking at where I can adapt and innovate and iterate. Like you could have used the last, you know, 18 months absolutely beautifully I mean, you could have found another enterprise that was way more profitable and enjoyable for you. That could have been the best thing you ever did. Or you could have stayed open and done it from a mindset of resisting it and resenting the fact that you had to wear PPE and that your customers, you didn't get to have the interaction that you used to have with them and you didn't get to make the same level of cash sales from each individual person. Or, you know, you, you could have sat and resisted the whole thing and being open could have been a terrible decision for you to have made because your mindset literally influences everything that you do. And yeah, so that was the conversation that we got to of it. It's, it you know, a lot of the time we talk about do I do something? Do I not do something? There's a positive thing to do and a negative thing to do. But actually, the choice of the action that you take is really depend. The quality of the, that choice is dependent on the mindset that you make it from. And, and that's the stuff that I spend my days, day in, day out, talking to people about, getting them to think about. Um, yeah. So that, does that recap where we got to, Mark? It does indeed, Kim. It does indeed. Thank you. And it's, it certainly made me think that certainly made me think yeah. um, it's a nice place for me to springboard off and as mark said um you know this is this is your your coffee break your lunch break moment so i don't want this to be like a formal and here's a training session for you um you know this is something to sit back and enjoy um so please fire questions and um you know let's make this a really nice interactive session um but one of the first things it does get me nicely segueing into is one of the concepts I think that sort of roots me in why I do what I do because a lot of the time whether we're in our working space or our personal space you know we're really clear on what it is we want to have well at least we like to get focused on it you know like what are my goals what are my targets so if we talk about the professional space what are the things I want to achieve the jobs I want to have the the teams I want to manage you know there's, you've got a set of goals quite often of what you want to have you know that's that's pretty clear 
And then, um, and if you've got line management that haven't made that clear, there's something going wrong. And then quite a lot of the time you then stop and you're like, hey, well, what do I have to do? What is the choices? What are the actions I have to, to take to successfully hit all of those goals? And so we spend a lot of time talking about what do I need to do to do my job really well? And we analyze everything from how we manage our emails and how we manage meetings. And do I need more meetings or fewer meetings? Do I need to be doing my productive work in the morning, my less productive work in the afternoon? You know, we're constantly looking to manage our to-do lists and our doing in order to optimize what we wanna have. And yet the thing that we neglect to do the thing we really, I mean, I'm I, even with people I'm coaching, sometimes I'm like, guys, you know this stuff, but we deprioritize the focus and the time we spend on the place that we do all of those things from. And so for me, mindset is the foundation of absolutely everything. I mean, if you think about it, let's just take a simple thing like sending out an email. If the mindset you're sending an email from is, I really don't get on with this person. I really wish I wasn't working on this project. I don't have time to craft this properly. I, you know, you, you're getting a sense of where I'm going. Yeah. If the mindset is resistance, I don't want to be doing this. I'm not enjoying this. I don't like this. Then guess what happens to the quality of what goes into your emails? And in fact, the science is really phenomenal behind this. There's a beautiful um, piece of research that was done by a guy called Dr. Stephen Porges, who um, researched polyvagal theory. And he basically has begun to understand something called our vagal nerve. And it's an incredible nerve that runs over huge, vast parts of your body. And this nerve connects all of your inner thoughts to your exterior outer appearance. And not just that, so your body language is giving away. If you don't want to be in something, you know what it's like. You know, if you didn't want to be on this call, I could see it. You know, you can tell when a colleague is in a, in a session or in a, in a Zoom call or in a meeting room and they don't want to be there, you know it. But not just that, that resistance and that mindset or, or, or having a level of doubt or um, not believing in yourself, having that as your mindset actually is proven to limit your ability to access language. So you can't even find the words to express yourself differently when your mindset is in a particular funky place. So mindset for me is absolutely everything. If you can shift yourself into a space that is, yes, as Mark said, positive, but not fake positive, right? Not the, I'm going to be positive today. I'm just going to push it and force it in a genuinely positive way. And not just necessarily positive, like you can get really creative with the mindset you want to have. It can be, um, today I want to be caring and compassionate. Well, that's a mindset you can climb into. Or today I want to be ambitious and excited. That's a mindset you can climb into. And if we can find a way to consciously shift our states into these more powerful places, then we can play with something that's truly exciting. Then we can find what we call our flow state. And has anyone heard of flow state? I'm looking for a couple of nods of those of you know. So flow state is really that place. Um, actually, has anyone got an example of flow state of when they've known they've been in a, in a flow state? I, either just take yourself off mute and jump in and shout at me. Kim, is that when you feel like you can achieve something and uh, the time just like passes by without you actually realizing. I think there is a lot of research done by, um, what's his name, Michal Csikszeg, Mihaly. There is a book that he wrote about being in the flow. Yeah. So yeah. it's actually lovely. Yeah, Michaela, you're definitely, is that sort of like you don't even, you're not, you're not even focused on time. Time is irrelevant because you're just in this moment. Um, anyone else? I noticed a couple of other people popping themselves off mute. Do you feel free just to jump in? Hi, uh, hi. This is Nilima. Um, I think for me, it would be definitely um, while gardening or doing some creative projects because you just kind of lose um, the track of time. Yeah. So that's possibly one of the times when I have experienced that flow state. 
I love that. And I'm seeing some of you as well talking about playing tennis and um, that, that feeling of being in the zone. That's exactly it. Um, um, Katie, I'm loving hi, hun. Um, I'm loving that painting furniture is the thing that does it for you. Um, Katie, can you come round if I give you the address? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyone who, do, who gets that flow. No. <laughs> um, yeah, it's exactly that. And it's, you've everyone's experienced it you just might not have been conscious of it but you you might have experienced it at, at work you know when sometimes when just everything just lines itself up and you're like that was somehow really straightforward and really easy and it just all came together and in fact Michael Jordan talks about this in a really beautiful way if you've ever heard any seen him in any, any documentaries it's he's a really great person to listen to because a lot of athletes talk about going into flow state where basically their thoughts are lined up with their actions and their goals. And so there's nothing saying, so Katie, you know, there's nothing saying to you, I can't get this furniture painted today. I haven't got the paint I need. The weather isn't playing ball. Like, you know, there's no, there's nothing contradictory to what you're wanting to achieve in terms of your thought process. And, and anything that happens, even if the weather did, the heavens did happen to open, it would be a meh, the heavens have opened, you know? I'm painting my furniture, I'm in my good place. So flow state is, it's a beautiful place to be. You are at your most efficient. In fact, McKinsey did a piece of research looking at um, the impact it has on your um, outputs. And I'm gonna misquote because I'm not remembering the number, but it's something like you are 25 times more efficient in flow state than you are when you're not. So this isn't just, oh, it's a nicer place to be. This is game changing in terms of what you can process and manage. You know, we talk about being resilient. Well, welcome to flow state. That is exactly the place that we're talking about. So it's got this efficiency. It's got resilience in it. It is also you finding your authentic place. Because when you're in this state, you are true to what you are absolutely capable of doing um and I think I'm going to just pause there because on that I, there's another thing I want to talk to you about but I just want to just recap where we've got to how many of you can relate to this idea of actually when you are being in a slightly funky place and I mean funky place it can be anything from you're feeling negative about yourself you um are not trusting yourself maybe there's a bit of imposter syndrome going on or it's a case of you feel like you're having to fake it and maybe you're having to like, um, you know, step outside your comfort zones and you're really a bit terrified and it puts you, you know, that place is a bit on edge. Can you relate to any of those mindsets and how they do not allow you to go into flow state and the impact it has on your work or on what you're doing? Um, anyone relating to that and any, any stories you can share with me? Laura, Laura I... we're not hearing you. Sorry. I definitely relate to it, Kim. Um, and I will just say that there, I have some clients who are, you know, I find particularly difficult to deal with. They're awkward personalities. They, they don't quite, quite match mine. And I have experienced, if you approach them thinking, oh, I don't like this man, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit scared of this person, Things always go wrong, and you think it's this this client. It's, it's always going to go wrong for them. But from what you're saying, it's much more about how you could have approached it yourself that might make that. Yeah, one hundred percent. So what you're beautifully segueing into is that mindset is not just about the mindset we have about ourselves. So there's, you know, one of the things that'd be interesting to look at is what are you believing about yourself in those interactions? Are you believing that? you can't handle those relationships or that you can't enjoy those relationships you know that's really interesting so that's a bit about you and then there's the bit about what are you choosing to believe about others and and that is so powerful because they will show up exactly the way you have labeled them that you believe them um, in fact I was having a conversation with someone just yesterday and um, we were talking about actually it was an internal team and they were saying to me um, they really need to get this internal team on board. Like it's crucial to the success. So they know what they want to have. They've got to secure X number of clients. And in order to get those clients and to deliver the best kind of service to those clients, they need this internal team. And when we unpacked it, we were like, first of all, there's a belief that that 
internal team doesn't want to cooperate, isn't professional, doesn't want to play by their rules. You know, there's all that judgment. And so she had to, she was like, oh my gosh, I am taking all of this belief into that meeting. And I was like, and how did it go that time you did it? And she was like, it was awful. Like, like we ran it the first time and everyone came, but nothing came from it. And everyone was like, we don't think we should even have these meetings. We shouldn't cooperate in future. She, she went back, tried to fix it. And, but she still took all that judgment back into that meeting room. And guess what happened? Two people showed up and the guy, instead of spending a meet, an hour with them, spent 15 minutes with them. And yet again, demonstrated how they didn't want to play ball with that team. And she came back, she was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this because I'm not giving them a window of opportunity to be something else. So, so you, you're absolutely right. It's both what we do within ourselves and the mindset we project onto others. So yeah, beautiful. And I think if we're looking for one particular thing, like if we're looking for an orange thing in the room, we'll always see the orange things and we'll ignore all the other colors yeah. in the room, won't we? So thank you, Kim. No, there's that beautiful um, YouTube video on attention. I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, whether it, there are two teams playing basketball, one's wearing black, one's wearing white and they ask you to count the number of times the basketball is thrown between the white players. And in the middle of it, so you're there counting all the numbers, but there's a, a, a moonwalking bear that comes through that you just totally do not see until they go, oh, oh you've obviously seen this video. Um, you know, you go back and watch it, like, oh my gosh, there was a guy moonwalking in a bear costume right the way through that video. And, and that's exactly it. And there's a, an academic called Otto Sharma who's written an amazing piece of work called Theory You on how you achieve change. And um, he talks about this uh, concept of past experience listening. And it's exactly that, that you go into meetings, you go into interactions, listening through a lens of your previous experience, listening for the color orange, you know, in effect. Um, and it just clouds everything. And, and you can meet someone for the first time. So you could have come onto this call and I could have resembled someone who you had a terrible interaction with. And then it's game over because the only thing you're gonna listen to from me is how I show up exactly the same way that person showed up and you'll get nothing from this. And so we have this bias in our listening um, that it's lovely to play with so we move past that experience. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm loving this, uh, that, that it's, it's relating, that you're getting a sense of your mindset affects everything that you do. I mean, literally everything that you do. Um, and, you know, in principle, it's like, okay, great. Well, today I'm going to choose to be positive or I'm going to choose to be ambitious today. Let's, there you go. And yet it's so not as straightforward as that. You know, the, the principle is so simple and yet doing it. I mean, how many of you have been in a bit of a funk lately and you're like, I just couldn't pull myself out of it that day. Now I can see you relating to that. Like my husband knew about it recently because I was in it for a week. And he was literally like, oh my God, you need to get out of this. And I was like, I know, and I'm a mindset coach and I can't get myself out of this. This is terrible. Um, but you know, I got there, but wow, it was painful whilst you're in it. And because there's like a momentum that builds. And so it's not just important that we're conscious of which mindset we're in. We gotta be conscious about how much we're fueling it. Um, and I, I was away last week and I was interacting with uh, someone very close to me. And they made a comment about uh, my son that came from a really good place. They were basically saying, um, you know what, it's okay, he's six. Apparently you've got until seven to mold him to get him to good. And I don't know if any of you are parents, but I was like, you're what now? Did you just tell me that my child needs to be molded into something that's better than he is? And like the inner rage just went, <laughs> I mean, like talk about red mist, I was in it. And so what did I do? I didn't go in that moment and go, whoa, pause. You are giving way too much fuel to this now. No, no, I went and text messaged my best friend. Can you believe that this person just said this? And you know what she said? Oh my God, I can't believe they just said this. And wow, I had set the whole thing on fire. And there's this beautiful analogy of, um, you know, uh, I think it's, is it Los Angeles? No, it's not, it's um, San Francisco with all the hills, isn't it? And the idea of like having a car parked on the very top of one of these hills. Now you can take it out of gear 
And if you just gave it a little nudge, it would just roll itself down. And at the very beginning, when it's starting to move, you can actually just stand in front of it and it'll just stop itself. But you wouldn't want to do that when it's at the bottom of the hill, right? Because at the bottom of the hill, you're just getting out of the way because nothing is stopping that car from moving. And it's the same with our mindsets. If you catch it straight away, you're like, oh, whoa, I'm just about to step into that place where I'm really doubting myself. Or I'm just about to step into that place where I'm getting angry and frustrated. If you can catch it early enough, you stop the momentum and you can shift yourself into a different place. But all too often we just go, oh, I'm going to run with this. I'm going to push that car down that hill. I'm just going to, you know, and we do it. And this is often that water cooler moment you know, which we're not getting directly, but I bet you're still text messaging each other at work, you know, being like, I just had this email from so-and-so, can you believe it? You know, and all we're doing is we're just pushing the car down the hill. So there is a discipline in mindset that, um, that I think is actually really beautiful. It's really fascinating. This is the exciting thing for me. This is the roller coaster that we get to be on all the time of catching those thoughts and, and noticing them and asking ourselves, is this a helpful thought, a helpful mindset for me to be stepping into right now? Um, do any of you consciously know you have those moments sometimes? Or, or, or are you any good at catching those thoughts, at catching the emotions? You know, it's like maybe it's like anger or fear or anxiety, that that's the emotion and it pops up, but we don't stop it and go, oh, is this helpful right now? I've had purposely work at it. Um, I spend time in the mornings thinking about what emotions I want to watch out for. Beautiful. And actually, you know, it, it's still hard, you know, you, you know, you still sometimes just get by. The reason I went into it is because I, you know, I do a lot with nutrition and a lot of that is around mindless eating and, you know, letting stress drive your hunger and, and, you know, um, what I've found out is that actually, if you stop and think and ask yourself some questions, it abates a lot of the, 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 the compelling need to, you know, go and eat something, or, you know, it, it actually managed to dissipate that, but it, it, it's, it's a muscle. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, uh, I, yeah. I love the idea of it being a muscle because, you know, we go and get personal trainers get us into the physique we want to get into, you know, we don't really think about personal training for them, for our minds. And that's exactly all of what you're, you're talking about us really wanting to do. You know, if I always think about if your emotions and your thoughts were items in your wardrobe, and when you got up in the morning, you were like, hmm, what should I wear today? Like, would you ever pick self-doubt? Like, you, I just, I can't imagine my going, yeah, I'm going to wear self-doubt today. That's really going to serve me well, you know, because actually what's happening is that we're actually waking up already dressed. Unless we go, oh, do I want to wear that today? Is that going to serve me today? So it's, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to, to start noticing. And actually it's why I'm such a massive advocate of uh, meditation and mindfulness um, because the meditative exercises of, um, focusing on your breath, like so simple, but so much we can learn from just noticing breath. If you can stay focused on a breath and notice when your thoughts disappear elsewhere and notice what that thought is, then you're noticing the thought. That's beautiful. That's the brain training to be in. Meditation is not about, I'm going to find some, you know, quiet time. I'm going to leave all my thoughts behind. Meditation is about learning about what's going on, noticing your patterns, you know, learning, oh, that's the thing that triggers me. And, it, and you can expand it into what we call embodiment, which is about noticing your body. So, if it, you know, it's noticing the thoughts and actually, um, well, noticing your thoughts is noticing your emotions and it's noticing your physique, your physiology, because these are all little clues as to, just checking, you know what outfit you're wearing today. You're about to go down the hill, looking like that. Are you sure that's what you want to wear? You know, for me, um, the physique element, my jaw, my jaw just goes rock solid when I'm not in a good headspace. I can feel all the tension, I get a lot of tension in between my eyes, but that, and it's beautiful for me. I'm like, oh, 
that's what I'm wearing today. This is not going to serve me. I've got to go away and do some work on it. You can journal. Don't do anyone do uh, morning pages is a beautiful thing to do. But first thing in the morning, just writing down, not what you want to be, not the minds that you want to be in, but just doing a stream of consciousness. In fact, we can have a little go at doing that now, actually. It's a really lovely, quick exercise. So it's not what you're forcing into your mind. It is literally just what is running through there right now. So have a go for me. If you've got a pen and paper or you've got something you can just quickly type into or just have a little reflection and notice it. If I just leave you for a minute and a bit, write down just everything that flows into your head. It can be like, oh, I can hear the birds singing. Oh, I haven't taken the washing out. Whatever is coming to mind. Nolly, it might be a wish I hadn't climbed that tree. Which I'm hoping you don't feel like that. And if you're noticing any emotions that crop up alongside those thoughts, notice that. And if you notice any connections to your body, does it make you feel relaxed and free having those thoughts? Does it make you feel tight and tense? Notice what your body's saying alongside it. Just take a snapshot. Maybe some of you are like, I've got nothing going on. What's wrong with me? I've got nothing going on in my head. I'm not thinking anything. And then there's the thought. And what becomes really nice is just to take a bit of a reflection. What do you notice about what is streaming? because we don't listen to that very often. We don't pay attention, don't shift our focus in and really listen to that very often. And so what are some of you noticing about the stream of consciousness? What do you become aware of by looking at it? And you don't need to share the exact thoughts. You can just share an observation of like, oh, I've noticed. This is what's happened. This is a pattern I can see. Pop it into the chat box or just pop yourself on mute. And you can also reflect on, this is a nice moment, us just having some time over lunch together. But when you're in the hectic moments, when you're in the stressful meetings or preparing for things that you don't want to prepare for, that's the moment to check in on the mindset, to check in on those thoughts. What are the thoughts that run through in those moments? What are the emotions that crop up? What does your body tell you in those moments? OK, 
Mackenzie, I love that observation that your pattern is thinking about your to-do list. I think so many of us are so preoccupied. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And I bet alongside that, there's a focus of haven't got enough time. Haven't got enough time. And then our focus is on what I've got to do and how I can't do it. Not terribly helpful mindsets for getting it done. Okay, Jim, reading as well, your pattern is um, what's next? What's coming next? What's coming next? What's coming next? Yeah, beautiful. And, and it's not to make these wrong. It's just this is your state you're in. There's a question that you can ask at this point, though, which is, is this helpful? It's not wrong and it's not right. There's no wrong or right mindset. I really need you to be clear about that. If you start making your mindset wrong, you are going down a really, really, really challenging path. So it's just, it is what it is, but is it helping? Is that going to help you get done what you need to get done and help you have what you want to have? And if you're looking at your inner dialogue and your emotions and your physiology, and that is lining up with, yes, that is going to be conducive with me doing everything I want to do and getting everything I want to have, then you are in that space for flow. But if it is going, oh, you're like, oh, wow, that is going to make it really hard. Then you are now becoming aware of a mindset that isn't helping you. Has anyone got um, a, um, a thought in there that we would say is unhelpful to have? Like maybe it's like, I don't have enough time or I can't do this or I don't have the answers or I'm not experienced enough or I'm not whatever. Kim, I've got a there's this one issue, this challenge that um, I'm facing currently. Um, that overriding, whenever it's there in the back of my mind the whole time, and I can't, you know, at night I'm thinking about. It. I'm thinking about it before I go to sleep. I'm thinking about it before, you know, as soon as I wake up. Um, everything I'm doing, it's there, just like this horrible sort of devil in my head that I can't do anything about. Yeah, beautiful. So there's two things. One is, um, are you your thoughts? And I'm loving no. them. Because I can say to you right now, uh, you are purple with pink spots. Mm -hmm. And I want you to literally say that in your head, I'm purple with pink spots, I'm purple with pink yeah. spots. Right? It's a thought that's now in your head. Does it make it true? I'm just checking that none of you think you are purple with pink spots. <laughs> okay, sorry. Because, and, and this is what we have to understand is that we think that because the thought is in there that somehow it is gospel and it is truth. And it is just a thought. So what we have to do is begin to have a very different relationship with it of A, it is a thought. And that's the thing is like, you know, clearly it's not a helpful thought, Mark. So it's like, well, I'm not my thoughts. It is a thought. Is it a helpful thought? No. Is it true is the question I have for you. So is it true, your thought? The, 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 the root of it is true, but the, um, um, my mind is blowing it up out of all proportion. Right. Um, is it and, really true? Um, yeah, I upset somebody. Okay, but is it true that you can't get past that? Um, no, it's not, tr that's not true. No. Right. Yeah. But it sits there and it's, and without addressing it and having a bit of a relationship with it, it becomes something it's not. Yep. It becomes something untrue. But now all of a sudden we go, it's a thought. It's not true that that has to stay and remain the thought. It's not true that it has to be there. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't have to be the thought, I want you to notice that you are fueling that thought. You have pushed that thought all the way down that hill. Can you see mm -hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're giving it all your focus, all of your attention, and it is gone. But now I've got to get you to, I wish I'd caught it right at the beginning because we could have just nudged it back. But now it's like, it's, a, it's like basically hitting the ocean right now. So we're just going to go, okay, you know what? But it's not a helpful thought and it's, it's not true. So now I have to have this conversation of this real inner wisdom of like, what is true and what is helpful? 
for me to replace that thought with. So what would you say is true? Can I get you to give me the phrasing of the thought that would be true? Um, that, um, so it's difficult without, uh, because it's a business related, so I, um, <laughs> really simple and generic of like yeah. I can repair this relationship yeah 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 okay yeah which, which is what I'm trying to, to 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 do but then you I you suddenly I get to the point where I think the whole world is against me and there's a big conspiracy out there and yeah, yeah. shows how far I've gone down that damn hill doesn't it <laughs> you are like I mean you're basically trying to get that car out of the ocean now yeah yeah we can, we can. but what you have to do is have the discipline to have this conversation of like, I've seen this thought, whoa, this is, this is not making me happy. Yeah. And it's not going to, if you stay focused on that, you're not going to get that relationship back because all you're doing is convincing yourself you're not going to get the relationship back. Yeah. So instead it is literally like rewiring it. And you're like, my focus is going to be, I can remedy this. I can get this relationship back. I can mm. get it back. I can get it back. I can get it back. And you say it over and over and over. And it becomes the record you listen to of I can get it back. But I'm going to now give you, do you remember, I think in the, in the blurb for this, I was like, I'm going to share with you what I feel is the most powerful concept in mindsets. And that's the bit I think is now appropriate for us to talk about. Um, have any of you ever come across the work of Patsy Rodenberg? I just need to check if that's a name any of you I think Katie might Katie Hillett might have because I think I might have mentioned um, her to them before I'm going to really recommend for you at this point in time a book called Presence by I even got it it's normally lurking not too far from me no I haven't got it with me but um it's Presence by Patsy Rodenberg and she's a drama coach but um, I am in many, I feel like I wear lots of different hats. One of the hats I wear as a communication um, practitioner is how to get people to find their best mindset to communicate. And I came across her work when I was researching a lot of this space. And she's developed a way of understanding ourselves and others that for me is the most game changing way of understanding mindsets that I've ever come across. And so are you ready for it? Because I really want to share this with you. Patsy's concept comes from years and years and years of studying drama students. She is a, um, an acting coach and she's worked with Judy Dench. I mean, like she's pretty much it in terms of acting coaches. And um, she was sat on a panel uh, recruiting students into, I think it was RADA, I don't remember the drama school. And basically colleagues alongside her were like, no, they're not getting in. They haven't got it. Uh, yep, yeah, she's got it. Yep, yeah, he's got it. No, they haven't got it. And she was like this it thing. Like she's like, I, I know what you mean. There's this idea that some of them have got presence and others haven't. But she just felt this sense of injustice, which I really relate to, of it cannot be that some people have it and others don't. But it must be that some people know how to access it where others don't. And in that, she's developed this idea that we have three circles of energy. Now, energy, as she talks about it, I mean, I think we can all relate to the idea of having physical energy, right? Like if someone walks into a room and they are in a really bad mindset, like you feel it physically, don't you? You're like, oh God, I just, oh, please, can you leave? I don't want to be anywhere near you. Or if someone walks in and they are in the most beautiful place, you are buzzing from it, right? So that's what we, you know, we're getting a sense of energy already, but what she's talking about is focus. Where are you focusing your thoughts, your emotions, and your body, right? So three things always. And she talks about there being a first circle, a second circle, and a third circle. Now, first circle energy is where you are really contracted. So that's the physical feeling of being really contracted. Um, we often, I think, talk about this being introverts, right? But I don't want it to be like an introvert extrovert thing, although I think you'll see the pattern, but it's that sense of just wanting to be really small. Have any of you had those moments where you're like, I just want to crawl up in a ball and hide. I want to disappear away from the world. and I don't want anyone to find me. And you will notice your shoulders move in and round. Your whole physique literally moves to make you smaller. And your thoughts in that place are typically 
I can't do this. I don't know how to fix this. I haven't got a way forward. I haven't got a solution. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not male enough. I'm not, you know, we just, I just, I, I can't. And all of those thoughts and the emotions of fear, anxiety, push you into this really contracted space. And when you're in first circle, it's quite typical that people don't even notice when you're in the room. You try and say something and no one hears you. You ask a question, no one answers it. Like it's so unbelievably profound. In fact, I was sat completely, you know, I was saying I was in a funk recently. I was in first circle. And when I go to first circle, it is powerful first circle. And I spent an entire three days with people and not once did anyone ask me a question about what was going on with me. And it was because I was sat so firmly in first, it didn't even occur to people to do it. Not their fault. It's entirely me. I was sat all of my focus and energy being in here. I was not connected with anyone around me. So that's first circle. How many of you, can you give me a raise of hands or a yes in the chat or a good nod? If, can you relate to going into first? Yeah. Now it's fine. There are moments where you need to go and recharge in first. I mean, you can't sleep in anything other than first. Like, you, you know, you can't meditate unless you're in first. There are moments where you need to go and refuel. But if you need to have presence, authority, uh, you need to lead, you need to just be able to communicate effectively. You cannot stay in first. So it's about checking in and going, are my thoughts, my physiology or my emotions taking me into first? And I think you can relate to it. You know it when you're in first. Now I'm going to jump to third, right? We're going to come back to second. Third is like the other end, right? And it is often the space we talk about when we talk about extroverts. I remember when I first started teaching um, presentation skills, everyone was like, I want to be like Michael McIntyre on a stage. And Michael McIntyre does third, right? It's the energy that is like all out there. It's massive. In fact, if you're with someone who's in third, a lot of the time you might be like, wow, that is taking up my space. Yeah. And you might be able to relate to friends and family that even do that. And it's, it's a presence and an energy that is very scattered. So it doesn't have a deep, solid connection to it. It's like someone just sprayed an aerosol. It kind of goes everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And, and as a result, there's no authentic connection with someone when they're in third. They are great at whipping around and getting a party started. How are you doing? You're having a great time, but you're not going to have any deep, meaningful conversation with someone in that state. But we often talk about royalty spending a lot of time in third or celebrities spending time in third because they're not going to give you that authentic connection, but they're going to work the crowds and, you know, make you feel like you've had a bit of a, a good time. Yeah. So that would be third. And in third, your thoughts are often overcompensating. So it's not an authentic confidence in third. It's a faking it confidence in third it's that I'm I'm gonna have to be louder more brash more you know take over with my body language because I'm trying to really I'm trying to overcompensate for the fact that what's real underneath that is a fear is a sense that I can't do this is a sense that I don't have the answers and when that fear really kicks in and you've got perhaps management that sit in third, it, you often then find they move into that um, transactional leadership space where they just bark orders, tell you what to do, follow what I'm saying you should do because that's the right thing to get done. They don't listen very well, but it's coming from a state of fear, from a state of being uncertain about themselves. Can you, any of you relate to that? Perhaps you know yourself when you go into third. In fact, I can. I've got to check myself because I can tip into third even when I'm talking and I lose a lot of people, right? You know, I've got to stay, as we now know, in second. We're going to go there. But can you relate to third? Any of you feel like you go to third really easily? Or you know people who go to third? Yeah, beautiful. And you'll know the moments that take you there. There's people and environments and places that might take you into that space. And some people are a bit infectious and can lead you into third really easily as well. Um, that's the, the point, actually, that water cooler moment when someone's going, oh my gosh, oh, like you're in third then, that gossip moment, you're fueling up the car to push it down the hill. It's just sat in third. So of course we have, and also I should say that first circle, your focus is often on the past. You're bringing all that past experience into your new reality. So Laura, the stuff we were talking about with bringing preconceived ideas about people into those meeting spaces, it's often a moment of first. You're just bringing all that, that past into the present. With third, 
you're really focused and preoccupied on the future. I don't know what's happening today. So part of my funk recently was, I can't see what's going to happen. I don't know how, I don't know how to pull this bit together. I don't know what it should look like. And I was spinning in third. And it took my dear husband who, bless him, he's been pretty much on a lifelong training course with me with this. So he was like, I think you're in third. I'm not in third. Oh wait, yes, I'm in third. Um, and then, so, so that's our first and third. And, and of course, then we want to talk about second. Because second circle energy, second circle focus is authentically you. It's the part of you that is not worried about the past because you can't control that. It's not worried about the future because you can't control that. It is totally and utterly centered and focused in the now. And your now is a quality of thought that is honest. So Mark, the way we talked through, well, is it true that you can't fix that relationship? No. So the quality of I've ruined that relationship, I'm never gonna get it back, it's gonna ruin everything, I, I'm an awful person. Which circle is that sat in? Are we going like this? All of you first, right? You can hear it now, right? First circle. So to take a breath and go, well, it's not true. What is actually true? It's actually true that I can, I can fix this relationship. And if you're suffering from that feeling of like the imposter syndrome, right? The imposter syndrome is, I can't do this. Is that true? So when, when we shifted into having to, to do everything virtually, a lot of people were like, I can't have meaningful relationships on Zoom. I can't build teams. I can't teach. I can't do this on Zoom. It's impossible. I'm like, is that true? Is it true you can't share emotion and communicate powerfully on Zoom? Because every time I turn my TV on, it makes me cry or get scared or it's making me feel emotions. That's a screen. And those people aren't even live with me. It's pre-recorded. Like, there is nothing that says you can't create amazing, powerful things on Zoom, but it's where your focus is. So instead, if your thoughts are, well, of course I can do this. And it's not third of, of course I can do this. I got this, like third, right? It's, of course I can do this. Can I get, every, can I get enough done today that will shift enough on my to-do list to make this day meaningful? Yeah, of course I can do that. Can I manage my diary in a way that is productive? Of course I can. Can I see the best in others before I meet with them? Can I connect with the best in myself? Yes, of course I can. Can I be ambitious? Yes. Can I be confident? Yes. Can you hear how it sounds when you're in second? So your thoughts are honest. I love all the conversation that um, bands around TED Talks and all these beautiful places around authenticity and vulnerability, but finding your authenticity, the real you is in second. And in second, you are capable of everything. And in second, it's not just that you have a series of thoughts that are helpful and true, but there is an excitement and an energy about them. So in second, it's not just that you are in second and you, are, you can connect with people and you have presence in second because you're not in your thoughts, you're not in your emotions, you're not in the past, you're not in the future. You are just with whoever you are. And if that whoever you are is your to-do list, you are just with your to-do list. Or if it's just your furniture that you're painting, you are just with your furniture that you are painting. In second, you are in flow. So in second, it's that quality of thought, but it is also your body that has to follow and your emotions that have to follow. So if you sit up lovely and straight wherever you are and you just put your head just to balance beautifully on your, on your spine, and there's a little bit of smile that creeps across your face. And there's an energy you can feel pouring from within you. Like, you know that excitement where you're like, things are a little bit magical. Things are a little bit alive. Can you connect with that idea? Because that's what it is. It's not just that you are 
able to do anything you want to from this place of real deep knowing I can do it, but there is a tingling, exciting, magical energy about it. There is a spark about it. There is an aliveness about it. There is a, not only can I do it, I can do it that you bring to any scenario you're in. And that is the place of the most powerful mindset. Now, if you do and you function from second, you are creating unbelievably powerful things. You are crafting emails that have got language and words in them that you never knew you had access to. You find a voice of leadership that you never knew you had access to. You find decisions that you couldn't conceive of coming to. So it is a most beautiful, beautiful, powerful place to find your second circle energy. Any questions? Because I know we're closing close to the last five minutes on feeling in second circle. Have any of you been there? Do you know that feeling? Would you like to see if you can quickly get yourself there with me? What are your thoughts? Thanks, Irina. I appreciate that. <laughs> Kim, hi, it's Nat over here. Thank you so much. It's, it's been such a great, um, I was going to say presentation, but really a great talk. Um, question I have for you, I, I'm actually a, a coach myself, but a question that I often you know, find myself thinking about is, is it, because people go through their own journeys with it and, and some people can are maybe quicker to master that and some people you know, take a little while to get the hang of it. So do you think, is it just a matter of practice, practice, practice and sort of fake it till you make it? Or is there anything else that you can kind of bring in to supercharge um, your journey uphill, <laughs> if you like? Love it. So if you're faking it, you're not in second. Hmm. So I really, this whole thing, like fake it till you make it. I'm like, no, find second and then you'll make it. Um, but I absolutely appreciate it. I see it with my clients as well. Like there's those that are like, yeah, good to go. And those that are in the good to go space are, my goal is, my goal is self-development. My goal is to learn, to see myself differently, to challenge myself, to constantly put myself on the spot and say, am I in first, second or third? Like those are the guys that get it so fast. And they're like, the appetite is insane. I've got one person I work with. I, I, I can barely keep up with her. She is so good. She's so brilliant. But because she's just like, yep, oh yeah, I'm in first. And she owns it really quickly. But her belief structure that she sits on is one of, this is important. I can do it. This is going to be game changing for me. But if you've got a belief structure that is still fundamentally sat in first, I can't do it. It's hard to do it. Um, I'm I'm not capable of doing this by myself. Like all of that, what we what we have to do, I think, as coaches, is get them first out of first by going. Let's just acknowledge what are the beliefs we're playing to right now. What are we believing to be true? And then, so it's both moving them into second through their thoughts, and then also hijacking bodies. Bodies are everything. I can ask you to be depressed whilst putting you into a physical state of being in second and you can't get depressed. You can, your body is everything. So if you go and do a nice Amy Cuddy power pose, you know, huge big smile on your face, take up loads of space, nice, you know, feet nice and wide apart, staring up at the ceiling, you cannot get depressed. It's, it's not, it, the, the biology does not connect because your body is sending a signal that, mm, no, I'm happy, I'm good. I'm strong. So it's moving them into that place a second through their thoughts, their emotions and their physiology. And then it's our responsibility then as coaches to stay in second because you can't get them to second unless you're in second yourself. Does that resonate? And then um, now what I would encourage you to do is, is to notice the techniques you use that get people to second. Because I mean, it's endless things. The one I'm personally enjoying at the moment so much is um, playing around with temperature. So some of you might have come across Wim Hof. Any of you heard of Wim Hof? The idea of like using breath in order to be able to withstand really cold temperatures for swimming. Um, but you don't have to go swimming to do it. You can do it in the shower every morning. Because like, if you know how to, 
like connect with your breath so well that your focus is not on your thoughts. It is not on your body. It's not on your emotions. Your focus is on something of like it's on your breath. You can withstand cold like that. It is so easy to do it. And actually it's for me, it's a bit of a test of which am I in first, second or third in the morning? Like, cause if I'm in, if I'm in first, I'm like, I am not even turning that to cold. You have got to be kidding, you know? So it's a be- but there's but there's so many different things. I I'm a massive fan of breath work, so I'm a breath work practitioner because breath is so powerful for me. And it's not it's just you finding the things that you love that work for your clients, and just starting to notice if they're in third, what are the techniques that get them to second? If they're in first, what are the techniques that get them to second? And maybe we should just keep comparing notes so that we help people even more. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. We'll definitely have a look at that and and get the get the book. Brilliant. Others of you, relating to second, fancy playing in second today? I'm getting well, I've got a couple of the yeses to the conversation we were just having, so that's brilliant in the, good. So I tell you what, since we are right at the end of this, I'm just gonna leave you, because I don't wanna take up any more of your time, but I'm gonna leave you with the opportunity to leave this meeting from second, right? So. Put your body into that really alert, upright, but it's relaxed, it's open. Feel as if that a, a smile, not just spreading across your face, but across your whole body and out into the energy space around you. Like just become expansive and open. And taking that beautiful deep breath in, I want you to connect with an excitement for life, for an excitement with what is possible right now. That's the only thing you let into your thoughts. And the focus of your mindset being, I've got today. I've really got today. I can go and get on with anything I need to get on with. And I'm really buzzing and excited about it. And you stay in second just a little bit longer after today. So thank you so, so much. Um, I hope you have fun playing with these concepts um, and do stay in touch. I love hearing from people um, about what you're getting up to or any further questions you've got. Kim, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, do you know what? Later today, I've got a, uh, I'm sitting on a conference or recording for a conference with Euro Money. Um, and first thing this morning, I looked at all the other people on the panel and thought, I'm not worthy. How am I going to do it? And I suspect I would have gone into third. Yeah. You would have been in first. You would I would have been in first, but then I would have put my, my I would have gone straight into, into third once we started recording. I, I, I'm, I'm going to do my best to be in second. I'll let you know how I get on. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. Thank okay. you. Um, Mahela, thank you so much for introducing us to Kim. Um, Kim, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Um, and Katie, thanks for thanks for organising today. Um, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next week, um, before everyone rushes off, um, she's already spoken today. You've already met her. Um, we've got Nat joining us. Um, Nat, um, looking forward to your session next week. Um, when more isn't enough. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Come back and join us all next week, everybody. Um, lovely. See you all soon. And um, uh, go out there and be in second for the rest of the day. Um, and every day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye.